understood the general principle of what the government was trying to do. But over the years, and it is years while this has been negotiated, it's got more and more complicated. It's getting to be something that no single individual will ever be able to understand. Well, it's Friday afternoon, and we've been working all week interviewing so many people that it has totally scrambled my brain. So I've come here to the London School of Economics to meet a man called Tony Travers, who everyone says will set me straight. Let's see. Well, the first thing to remember is that we start off with effectively a single organisation, that's London Underground. That's going to be cut up into four pieces. These are the managers who will stay in the public sector. And then there are three companies, one, two, three. These become private organisations and the managers will eventually disappear off as a separate unit into Transport for London. This is the Mayor of London who will be taking over the running of the managers. But these three companies will be running the tube tracks, trains and all the hardware once that happens. There will then have to be a series of contractual relationships between these companies, each one of them, and TfL. So far so good, but I've got a nasty feeling it's going to get a lot more complicated. But of course beyond all of this slot, the negotiations are being overseen by, in these godlike figures, the Department of Transport, local government and the region. It seems a host of government departments and independent bodies will also stick their oar in. And even further out, we've got people like the Transport Select Committee, the National Audit Office. But the thing I'm not capturing on, on this simplified version of what's going on is, of course, this isn't the only public-private partnership. There are other PPP-type deals for power, all sorts of things to do with ticketing and so on. And there's five of these and the mayor and his transport commissioner will have to have all sorts of contractual relationships with them and all of them back with these companies and so if you multiply all of this out it does mean a lot of complexity and crucially guess who stands at the margin of all of this it's lawyers and accountants questions the fear is that continual arguments over who's responsible for what will make the system unworkable. Take a simple issue. If one day uh, a train runs late or doesn't run at all because a point, set of points has iced up, the companies who will lose money as a result of this, if they are blamed, will say, oh, no, no, we, we have a proper de-icing system. It's just the temperature fell lower than the contract said uh, we had to do the de-icing up to. What TfL will say is, no, 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 we've got the Met weather, Met, Met, Met figures here, the temperature didn't fall below, and the companies will be saying, well, it did. And in the end, if that happens often, there'll be court cases about what the temperature was that night. What little the public has seen of the contracts is mind-bogglingly complex. This formula will be used to measure how well the private companies maintain things like staff toilets. This one covers cleanliness and comfort in stations and trains. Put your hand on your heart and t look me in the eye and tell me that it is quite acceptable to run a railway system that is already complex by using an algebraic equation like that, which is so complex. I'm told that a group of GCSE s students have no difficulty whatsoever in deciphering that. I, I know it may be beyond the bounds of, uh, it's uh, beyond of, journalists. of, of politicians and journalists, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's basically straightforward. So it's perfectly workable? Yeah. But it's difficult to believe the tube can get any worse for commuters. We rejoin one of our video diarists, Purnima. I'm having a nightmare of a journey today. Um, just to put things into perspective, I'm going to show you some of the tube maps and show you how it all works. Because of cancelled trains and incorrect information, she's been stuck for 40 minutes trying to get home on the central line. So, uh, I'm a bit pissed off, really. Pissed off. Pissed off, pissed off, pissed off. Meanwhile, Rob's having trouble getting down to his platform. OK, great. So you have to take 96 steps. It sounds like a Hitchcock film about the two, 96 steps. It's pretty spooky, too. Imagine if I had to, was in a wheelchair and a broken leg. Hugh's cutting it fine for the governor of Maryland. 
but continuing delays on the Piccadilly line mean Anna's only travelled five stops. It's nine o'clock now, and we left house with about a quarter past eight, so it's 45 minutes to come, a few miles. Um, I think we're in Knightsbridge or Hyde Park Corner now, so we're not making very good progress. A thousand more meters, we've got signal failure going on Finsbury Park area. Meanwhile, we're still trying to understand the public-private partnership. Even if anybody could actually fathom how PPP is meant to work, there's another little problem. We're not allowed to know the details anyway, which means that it's actually impossible for us to judge for ourselves whether PPP will be safe or value for money. That's because the government has decreed that until the contracts for the tube are finalised, the details should remain classified market-sensitive. It's as though the whole thing's been stamped top secret, and we're just told it's OK. Trust the government. Treasury financial support. So, for example, Parliament's Treasury Select Committee couldn't get any important facts about PPP out of Gordon Brown at all. But well, these are market-sensitive figures. The, well, where the, would I the, find it if I was looking through the budget the, books? You, you're interested in parliamentary scrutiny. Where would I well, find it? I think if you're interested in getting the, the, best, the best arrangement for the, for the taxpayer at the end of the day, you'll respect the fact that these are market-sensitive uh, issues. To work at in all, Brown used to answer 13 questions. Instead, he repeatedly said it was... market-sensitive, market-sensitive, market-sensitive. This is not about state security. This is about rebuilding London's underground railway, something which millions of Londoners, and indeed people in the rest of the UK, who are going to pay for it, by the way, will have a view. New Labour's solution for the tube has proved a nightmare to put together. The contracts are now two million words long and stand four feet off the ground. The government promised the system would be introduced by April 2000, bringing in billions of pounds but it's been delayed by its sheer complexity and by political... <laughs> Ken Livingston became mayor of London on an anti-PPP ticket. He wants to run the tube himself, but Gordon Brown at the Treasury has resisted. He wants to keep the spending out of the public sector, but never mind the sums, this is an old-fashioned political feud. I hope also our Chancellor won't um, be too offended if I don't lavish much praise on him. I think he's already heard far too much praise from the benches behind me that's good for any human being. People like Ken never give up. Uh, they carry these sorts of battles with them to the grave. In my 14 years in Parliament, I never had a conversation of more than 30 seconds or a minute with Gordon. On the other side, it's equally obvious that Gordon Brown would not cross the road to lend a hand to Ken Livingston if he was falling down the gutter. I mean, the pair of them literally loathe each other, and that kind of resentment simply can't be overcome. Livingston hired as his transport commissioner an American, Bob Kiley. Kiley was credited with reviving the New York subway. When PPP is signed and sealed, the government will hand the tube over to him. Kylie is scornfully dismissive of PPP. It is a contract and a process that is uh, complex, almost beyond imagination, which itself is a very dangerous uh, uh, aspect from the point of view of safety. And it also becomes extremely expensive from the point of view of value for money. The row has descended into political backstabbing. Dozens of stories have appeared in national newspapers from anonymous sources, with each side attacking the other. A file was circulated, casting doubt on Bob Kiley's record in the United States. Both sides were feeding the press with totally opposing versions of what was in the PPP contracts. I think there's been a lot of misinformation being put out by lots of people. We've heard uh, both Kiley and Ken Livingston uh, arguing that uh, the arrangement wasn't safe. There was no evidence whatsoever to support their claim. It's not been a particularly edifying process, I have to say. There's been a lot of spin in this game from, from all sides. Well, there has, yeah, it's, uh, you can call it spin, and I suppose I don't know where the line between public information and, and spinning gets drawn. I guess it's all in the eyes of the beholder. Um, but, yeah, yeah, there's been a big... I mean, I think it's a good thing that there's a debate going on. I think this has got to a situation where no member of the public can believe or should believe anything that anybody says. The political stakes have got so high 
um, that nobody's willing to be open and honest about it. While all this has been taking place, the tube has been deteriorating even further, and it's commuters who are suffering. And what's hey, it's going. Has it changed? They are going, but severe delays. Oh, severe delays. Oh, that's nice to know, yes. That's encouraging. Yes, well. <laughs> I joined Cynthia Hay, who runs Capital Transport, a campaign group for London's commuters, on a typical journey. The Miss Marple of the London Underground, she has been chronicling how much worse it's been getting in the past two years. The, the, the track is very curved, and when the train comes in, there's this really awful noise. You can hear it now. And well, I think it's, these are relatively new trains. They look very small. Well, they haven't performed very well. They had an enormous number of train failures on the central line last year. Across the network, delays cost travellers an astonishing cumulative total of 59 million wasted hours last year. That's 6,735 years. And with rush hour cancellations now the highest since 1996, this year will be even worse. At the same time, fares have been going up at twice the rate of inflation. It's recognised it's more stressful to travel into work and from work than it is actually to do your job. And you pay some of the highest fares in the world for this privilege. It's frustrating. It's expensive. The question is, is it dangerous?